Well, this Christmas we're talking about hope and talking about the hope that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. We have more reason to hope than any other person in this world. And it's because Christmas is the time that God sent hope into the world, Jesus, to once and for all show us and prove to us that God is for us and wants a relationship with us, not just for relationship sake, but for relating within the context of that relationship. Some of us miss that part. It's like I have a relationship with God, but then we're not relating with him. He wants to relate with you. And that's what White Christmas is all about, that you and I would re-enter into and even kind of go down the aisle, the wedding aisle, um, figuratively to remember our first love, as Revelation says, to remember why, the why behind the what of this whole thing, that God sent Jesus at Christmas time to be in relationship with us, and we can relate to him, we can trust him, that he's for us forever. With anything that he says beyond us trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior, now we know the God who is for us with anything that he says about Uh, marriage, about parenting, about our finances, anything that he tells us to do, he's doing it on our behalf, not because he needs anything from us. And most of all, that feeds our hope, that our hope, he's told us about future events, he's told us about promises that he's going to do in the here and now, that he's with us, that he's uh, going to provide for all of our needs. All of these promises are true as well, but also for our future, that there is going to come a day when he's going to come a second time. He says, I'm coming the first time as a lamb to die on the cross for your sin. Next time, I'm going to come with a sword. I'm going to come to do away with evil and pandemics and suffering and death and disease and sorrow and sadness. There's coming a day when everything's going to be done away with. Now you live like a chosen person. Now you live like a son or daughter of the king who knows that everything is for certain. All of my promises are for certain live on mission with me, living from a place of, hey, God's for me. Who can be against me? God is for me. He's, he's promised all of these things. Wow, Christmas time is a reminder of the hope that we have. You see, when you believe God, when you trust God about future events, things that are future to, to us in this time period, you have hope. You have hope. And the more I talk to people, Christian and non-Christians, I'm finding that few people have hope this Christmas. Yes, a vaccine is on the horizon, but it's still four or five months from now. It's not a whole lot to be excited about before I can get it. It's not a whole lot for me to be excited about. Yes, you do. And our prayer for you this season is that you'd have a white Christmas, that you'd be restored to the hope that you have in Jesus Christ, because that is, after all, why he sent his son. You have a heavenly father who desires relating with you. We said last week, we'll throw this up on the screen, not just an initiation of a relationship, but relating within the context of that relationship. That's, what, that's where the word relationship comes from. It's from relating. Are you relating with God? And will you reinitiate that relating that you had once in your lifetime? Will you do that this Christmas? Odds are you might have uh, drifted from that this year. The point of relating is to build trust. Can we throw that up there? The point of relating is to build trust. When you have trust, you believe what he said about your present and about your future, and that all produces hope. And that's our word this Christmas, that you'd really find hope. I think every time I touch this, it wobbles a little bit. Sorry about that distraction. But the role of prophecy, you remember we talked about last week, we talked about prophecy and how, you know, we, we just sort of shy away from this whole idea. Some of us believers, we, we shy away from it because we've seen so many people who like get immersed in prophecy, get so focused on prophecy, and it really becomes uh, the focus of their relationship with God is to figure out the time that Jesus is going to come back and wow, you know, this pandemic here and that event over here and this ruler in the world over here, maybe that's the beginning uh, of, of ushering in the end times and maybe Jesus is about to come. The truth of the matter is prophecy isn't for those things at all. He doesn't give specific dates. In fact, actually, in Acts 1, you ought to read it for yourself, the disciples say to Jesus, is now the time that you're going to usher in the kingdom? Is now the time? In other words, is this the time that you're going to rid the world of evil? Because they knew that had been promised. Even Old Testament believers believe that had been promised. And he says back to them, he says, "Um, I don't even know the time that I'm going to come back a second time. That's only known by my Father in heaven. Look it up. In Acts 1, that's only known by my Father in heaven. Times and epochs, we do not know. That's only known by the Father, the heavenly Father. So stop trying to figure out the time and stop getting, you know, distracted by the fact that the pandemic is, you know, and all these bad things that are happening are, you know, Jesus is bound to come a second time. He might. Hey, we're always living that hope. We always live in that eager expectation. 
but we plan as though it's going to be another thousand years. That's what we do as believers. We're always living in anticipation that it could happen today. Are we ready? And then we plan as though it's going to be another 2,000, 4,000. Who knows how many? He just said he was coming soon. And at that point, it had been 10,000 years, at least 10,000 years um, before uh, Jesus, Jesus came. Now we're 2,000 years in. I say 2,000 is soon compared to 10,000. We won't go into that. That's, as deep, that's deeper than I wanted to go with that whole thing. I'll be happy to talk to you about it one-on-one if you want to talk about that. Would love to. But here's the role of prophecy, okay? Here's the role of prophecy. You come back, come back together. The role of prophecy is for hope. The reason why God is so intent on every single believer throughout time knowing about future events that are to come, that's what prophecy is, what's going to happen in the future, is so that that believer in time has a reason for hope. That you and I, we as believers in Jesus Christ, I think we have reason to have more hope than any believer that's lived previous to because we have, we have the... Um, the fulfillment of every single prophecy that he said throughout the Old Testament that actually did come true, and I'm going to show you that today. And then we have all this track record, in other words, with God, and then he's given us more reason to hope by telling us that he's coming back a second time to rid the world of all of the things that just create angst and, and, and just you just wish didn't exist in this creation. So um, let, let's today I want us to talk, we're moving on from Adam and Eve, we're moving to Abraham. We're going to talk about a guy named Abram. And I just gave it to you. Does anybody remember what God changed his name to? Abraham. Very good. Very good. I'm sure you knew that from Sunday school class growing up. You, you remember that. Star by your name, you knew Abram was changed to Abraham. And <clears throat> he's the next major character in the story of God. And we're going to talk about his story. And, and actually, you've probably heard elements of his story. There are some that are more to get more airtime than others. Um, but you probably haven't heard this story, or if you read it, you just kind of rolled right on by it because you didn't know what it meant. Today, I'm going to read you a story you've probably never heard before, or if you heard it, you didn't understand. You were just like, okay, somebody somewhere, you know, who's been to seminary understands that story, but I'm not going to understand that story, and you moved right on. I'm going to, I think through this story that I'm about to share with you, we see in the most clearest of clear ways um, God's desire for relationship with mankind to be based on an on a an unconditional trust, or just really just a trust, a, a, a confident trust in him, that there's relating, because we see God as t- just, just tenacious, going after this relationship that he'd lost with Adam and Eve, and he wanted it to be a relationship of intimacy, of trust, knowing that what he said about the future was, in fact, going to happen. Here's what happened. Abraham was just another guy out there minding his own business. He had no Bible. Think about this. He had no church. There was no uh, formality at all. There was no, um, he didn't know how to pray, right? What's prayer? Abraham didn't didn't know about those things. There's not even a nation of Israel at this point in the history of mankind. And this is 4,000 years ago at this point. He's just minding his own business. And the Bible says that God shows up and he begins talking to Abraham. Now, we don't know exactly what that looked like. Was it an audible voice or was it some other way? But what we know is that he's talking, God is talking to Abraham. And he said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And that means that you're going to have lots of kids. And so far, he had zero kids. And he's like, you're going to have a lot of kids. And like, okay, Sarah's like barren. And that's going to make Sarah really happy because she wants to have kids. That's really cool. I'm like 80 now. And, you know, Abraham, excuse me, Abraham would say, I'm about 90 and, and Sarah's 80. He says, I'm going to make you into a great nation, and from you, there are going to be multiple nations, and they're going to have millions of children through the ages. And most significantly, he said, every family on the earth, think about this, every family on the earth is going to be blessed through your family because of what I'm going to produce and the person that is going to come to be out of your family, Abraham, that you are going to touch or you are going to influence every family on the earth. They're at least going to have the ability to place their faith in Jesus. You're going to touch and influence every single person because the Messiah is going to come through your line. Look at this verse, Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And here we are, 2,000, 4,000 years later, talking about him. I'd say that came true, right? Right? I'm going to make your name great, Abraham. And 4,000 years later in Vinings, Atlanta, Northwest Atlanta, Georgia, we're talking about this very same guy. And most likely you knew, at least this person knew, about Abraham before you came in here. Even if you're not a Christian, you knew about Abraham before you walked in here. I'm going to make your name great. And that certainly came true. And I will bless you and make your name great. 
and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And look at this. And in you, in you, interesting little preposition usage there. In you, that is in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, God keeps coming to Abraham, and then he disappeared for 10 years. And then he'd come back uh, to talk to him again and make some more promises. And then he disappeared for 15, Abraham didn't hear anything for 15 years after that. And, and so one day Abraham's going, God, you know, okay, I, you know, I, I believe that's you talking to me and everything, but I need to know something. Would you, would you show me a sign? Because you keep coming to me and disappearing. And, and, and God takes Abraham outside at, at this point. And he says, Abraham, look up at the stars. Abraham, you know, walks out, looks up at the stars. And he's like, okay. Do you see all the stars? Okay, yeah, I see all the stars. That's how many kids, if you can even count as many as the stars are in the sky, that's how many kids you're going to have. And he's like, okay, like, I, I believe you, but I'm like, I don't even have one yet. Would you just give me one? And then he'd say, and, and you see all this land around you? All this land, I'm going to give this to all of your families. Excuse me, all this land to your family. That all of your, your family is going to have this, this land. And of course, Abraham's like, okay, like, he's like you and I would be, right? If we felt like God had shown up and spoken to us, we'd be like, okay, I believe you, but like, if I give this some airtime here and start talking about this with my friends, they're going to think like, do, 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 you know, and it just, just that I'm crazy. And then <clears throat> God does the most amazing thing. And this is what the story that I want to talk about. And this is what I've been setting up. He enters into a covenant with Abram, like saying, you can hold me for certain that I'm going to do this in your life. It's a certainty I'm going to do this. It's found in Genesis chapter 15. If you go ahead and begin turning there or punching your, 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 your handheld there, go to uh, Genesis chapter 15. And while you're turning, I want to give you some background about covenants, okay? Because this is really important. You're, you're not going to understand this story unless you hear what I'm, I'm about to say. So the, the word covenant itself means to bond two things together as one. Covenants, we don't really use this term too much. Um, we use the term contract. You might use the term covenant with your HOA and your, your um, condominium complex, might, might call it a covenant, but it's really still a contract. We use the term contracts, and contracts is really man to man. God's not really involved. Covenant is involving God, and, and, and this is kind of how they thought back then. It, it literally meant to shackle or chain two things together as one. In a covenant, two people or two nations or two families would come together and they'd make an agreement and they'd say, we're shackling or bonding ourselves together. We're making this agreement. We are going to keep our promise. That's how they did it. Now, now covenants generally had four parts, okay? And, and the four parts were terms, oath, ratification, and then the curse. <laughs> the terms were um, you decided, okay, I'll do this if you do that. And I'll do that if you do this. And you kind of spill all that out. And, and those were the terms. Then the oath is actually where you said something out loud and you said, I solemnly swear I'm gonna do this, da 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 da, da. If you keep your end of the bargain, I'm gonna keep my end of the bargain. That's the oath. And then <clears throat> there was the ratification where you'd actually go through some sort of symbolic exercise and you'd exchange something or, or do something to demonstrate the fact that we're entering into a covenant. And then fourthly, there was this curse. And, and the curse was, if you don't keep up your end of the deal, okay, <laughs> Here's what's going to happen. Here's the consequences of what's going to happen um, if you don't keep up your end of the deal. Now, in a, wedding, in a wedding, you're familiar with three out of four of these in our modern day because, you know, we were birthed out of Judeo-Christian ethics, worldview. It's certainly not a Christian nation, but this nation kind of has some elements to it because it was born out of a Judeo-Christian worldview. And you see this most, most um, uh, graphically in our weddings today. Um, at the beginning of a, I do a lot of weddings as a pastor, younger guy, so a lot of people, you know, anyway, I mean, kind of, I'm, I'm doing a whole lot more weddings than I am funerals, and I'm not looking forward to the day when I have to do more funerals. Um, I'm kind of still doing a lot of weddings. Anyway, so the weddings, does anybody know what we call the oath part, excuse me, the terms part in our day, where we kind of spell out the terms in our, um, in our, in our wedding process? Anybody, they call it the close, close, we're going to get there, but the charge, I, I didn't set it up well. The charge, you know, it's like, <laughs> do you promise to love and to cherish and blah, 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 blah. And the person says, I do. The husband says, I do. And then I turn to the wife and I say, do you promise? And they say, I do. And then comes the, go ahead and say it. 
the vows, exactly. That's the oath part where you audibly say, okay, I, I promise to do, having to hold into this day forward and, and, and all of this kind of stuff. Or you write your own vows. You don't use the pastor's vows. You wrote your own vows. And <clears throat> that's sort of like your promise, your, your verbal promise there. And then what do we do to symbolically ratify? What do we exchange there at the wedding ceremony? The rings, exactly. Yep, yep. I thought somebody might say the kiss, but that comes after. You actually exchange the, the rings. And I'm going to give you this ring, and this ring symbolically, you know, it says all of my um, <clears throat> worldly goods are yours, and, and, and if you ever have any need, I'm going to be there for you. It's just sort of like your way of physically outward expression of an inward connection, like a baptism. This ring is an outward expression of the inward relationship that we've initiated. I'm giving you this ring, and then she gives me this ring. Now, the only thing that we don't have in our wedding ceremony that I'm actually thinking about bringing back to my wedding ceremonies is the curse, it's the curse. It, it, I'm thinking this is why marriages don't hold up, because we don't have, we've taken out the curse. It's like, if you don't do this, if you don't, you know, do her right, Bubba, you know, you're going down. And, and, and <laughs> um, you see, like, I'm thinking about this with my, I was t- telling this joke last night, and Noelle was actually listening to the, to the sermon. Uh, Elizabeth always hears the sermon on Saturday night, and Noelle asked to, to watch the, to listen to the sermon. <laughs> and I said, see, when I do your wedding, if I do your wedding, Noelle, um, like, we're definitely going to bring back the curse part because if he does you wrong, like, I'm going to be standing over there if I'm not doing the wedding, and I'm going to be like, yeah, if you don't hold up your end of the deal, yeah, see, that's me. I'm the curse part. Like, I'm, that's kind of my role in this whole wedding thing. I'm the curse part. Okay. So I'm thinking this is why marriages don't hold up as long in our day because back then in ancient Israel and ancient um, the Near East, ancient Near East, they always had these um, curses uh, afterwards if you didn't hold up your end of the bargain. Right, so terms, oath, ratification, and then there was the curse. Woe to the man who marries my daughter, Noel. Um, don't marry a, a pastor's daughter unless you're serious, unless you're serious. If you're serious, then okay, you can marry her. All right, but anyway, now here's, here's the different kinds of covenants. I want you to see this too, okay? When I was in seminary, graduate school, um, one of my last major areas of study, sort of in my last year, was um, Old Testament covenants and ancient covenants. And the concept of a covenant had been around a long time. This isn't like a Christian thing. This is um, really more of just what they did back then. Remember, um, Abraham didn't know anything about Christian. Abraham didn't know about Jesus. He didn't even know anything about a nation, Israel. Excuse me. I'll get this down. Um, a, A nation. There's no nation of Israel yet. This was just customary of the whole Middle East and the known world at the time. This was how they did covenants. And sometimes you'd ratify a covenant through exchanging shoes um, that meant that wherever you go, I'm going to go, and wherever I go, you're going to go, and you may not literally go there, but like I'm going to hear about your life and listen to, to your journey throughout your life, and if you ever have any need, I'm going to be there for you. I will come. My shoes will travel to, to where your shoes are, and, and I will. It's, it was sort of a money thing if you ever have any need. Um, another one was salt. <clears throat> um, they would take a pinch of their salt out of their salt bag. You carry around some salt with you. It was a preserver, but it also was a taste enhancer. And so, like, you wanted salt on everything back then. We, they didn't have refrigeration and, and, and things like we have now that make things taste good. They would just use salt all the time. And so they would pinch a little bit of their salt out of their salt bag and put it into your salt bag after they did the terms and the oath. And to ratify it, they'd take their salt, a pinch a little bit of their salt, and put it into your salt bag. What did that mean? That meant that if, you're, if your family ever has any um, food, this was a food thing, any need for food, if there's a famine in the land or anything like that, you can count on me to be there with some food. Um, a third one was weapons. Remember David and Jonathan? You remember that best friendship that they had, David and Jonathan in First Samuel? And what was common in, in that day was to exchange weapons, and they exchanged weapons with one another. Jonathan gives over all his weapons to David, and what that meant was, I'm pledging to you my strength and my power if your life is ever in danger from an enemy. Or something like that. They may not even be my enemy, but if you have an enemy and they're coming at you, you can trust me as an ally to come over and give you my weapons and my manpower. I'm going to fight with you. So there were all kinds of different covenants, but the most significant covenant and the most binding covenant was the blood covenant, the blood covenant, where you actually killed an animal and you'd spilt their blood. And what that represented was this. May it be done to me as we just did to this animal if I don't come through on my end of the deal, if I don't come through on my end of the the covenant. May it be done to me as was just done to this animal, right? And and then 
It actually further meant, I am dying to my right not to fulfill my promise. I am, just like this, this animal is dying, I am dying to my right not to fulfill this promise because this is before God and in a blood covenant, the two people are before God and it was an irrevocable decision. If you, say, if you entered into this, like it meant your death if you didn't come through on what you were covenanting to do. It was a, a death do us part kind of thing, sort of like a, a, a marriage should be, right? We say that at least in our vows, till death do us part, right? But I don't really mean that because, you know, there's always, divorce is always an option. That's kind of how we think as American and even as American Christians, right? But we're actually saying till death do us part in that, that wedding, right? <clears throat> this, is, this is a once and for all thing. That's why we're, we're doing this whole wedding motif and white Christmas decorations outside. <clears throat> and when they did a blood covenant, what they were doing was they were actually taking a, an animal or a group of animals and actually cutting them in half, like what, right down the middle, like in the, the body. To, and, and what they would do is they'd put them on two separate sides of the path, and, um, and they would walk through this path. They'd hold hands, and they'd walk through this path in between the animals, basically saying, we are entering into the death of this animal, and, and, and may it be done to me if I don't fulfill, as was just now done to this animal, if I don't fulfill my end of the deal. This is probably why we don't do this at weddings. Because, you know, the bloody and getting all over the, the bride's dress and then the bride's dress wouldn't be fully white anymore. It'd just be a bloody, bloody mess. All right, so anyway, now back to the point. You guys didn't laugh to that. I thought you guys were, anyway, so just the visual of, of, of that happening at a wedding. All right, so <clears throat> that's covenants in a nutshell, okay? And, and now your eyes are about to be opened with the magnitude of this story. You're about to read a story that you may have never read before or really isn't registered in your brain because of what you now know about covenants. It's just gonna come alive. This is gonna be amazing. All right, so Genesis chapter 15. Here's Abram, um, later named Abraham. I might call him Abraham throughout this, but he's he's Abram still in in this passage. Saying, God, you promised me this, okay? And then you disappear for 10 years. And then you promised me that and you disappear for 15. I, I need to know, I need, I need a sign. Would you do something to kind of let me know that this is really going to happen because you've promised me a lot of things. You've said, I'm gonna have a lot of kids. I don't even have one kid yet. You're gonna give me this land. I don't own any land. Um, you're gonna bless all the families of the, the earth through me? I mean, just give me something. And so God says, um, God does God does this amazing thing. So the Lord said to him, talking to Abram, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old. Verse nine, I'm in chapter 15, verse nine. Each three years old, along with a dove and a pigeon. So God says, Abram, go get all these animals. <clears throat> Abraham goes and gets all these animals. It might've taken some time. Verse 10, and Abram brought all of these to him. And then look what he did. Cut them in two and arranged the halves opposite each other. Seems sort of violent unless you understand what I've just now told you, right? The birds, however, he did not cut in half. And then birds of prey, vultures, came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. And as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And then the Lord said to him, these are great words right here, know for certain, do you love that? No, for, out of the mouth of God, I want you, human being, to, to know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants, he gives Abraham some future events. He gives Abraham some prophecy here, that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward, they will come out with great possessions. Notice he doesn't say Egypt. Notice he doesn't say in X amount of years. Abraham didn't know how many years, the exact year that it was going to happen, didn't even know which nation was going to enslave them. You just need to know that I'm going to be, it's going to be difficult. There's going to be a bumpy ride, but I am with you and you need not fear. You can have hope, Abraham. Verse 15, you, however, will go to your fathers in peace. In other words, you will die in peace and be buried at a good old age. And in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here to this very land. For the wrongdoing of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Now, let me, let, me, let me ask you a question before we keep going. What was Abraham expecting at this point was going to happen? Okay, we got all the animals. They're, they've been cut in half. There's blood all over the grass. And we've got the two parts of the animals on, on, on either side. And, and he's over there on the side waiting for his next instruction, probably sitting under a tree somewhere. 
And he's like, okay, I kind of am familiar with this because I'm, I'm a cultural man. I've been living in this culture, and I know what uh, pagans do. All right, God, you've told me to do this. It's a very common thing, the blood covenant and everything. This is the most serious of all the covenants. Now Abraham's expecting that he's going to have to walk with God somehow through this whole animal mess that we've got here, right? And this was going to symbolically say that I've got to now do something, but that's not what happens. And, and, you know, ever since the Garden of Eden, God's not been around physically anymore, right? So he's like, okay, I don't even know how God's going to show up and how am I going to hold hands with God? And is there going to be an angel that's going to kind of represent? I don't know. But, but Abraham, he's thinking to himself, now that all this has been set up, now we're going to have to walk through and there's going to be a part where I tell him what I have to do because it's vows, oath, and then, and then the ratification, that's where we walk through these animals, right? God's already said what he's going to do. He's going to make my name great. He's going to you know, give me a bunch of kids, give me this land. He's going to bless all the nations through me. God's already given the terms of what he's going to do, but now it's an if then, right? Now it's a, I'll do this if you do this, Abraham. And so Abraham's probably sitting over underneath a tree somewhere and he's thinking to himself, okay, I'm going to have to do a bunch of things in order for God to do all these things that he's now promised me. And then we're going to walk somehow, we're going to walk through these animals. That's what he's thinking, because that's what was always done. Look at this. He knew knew his part, going to enter into this covenant. Let me say something right before we get into verse 17. God probably would say to Abraham, "Um, I've already... I've already said what I've said. Now we both have to do something. I kind of just said, okay, sorry, got, got a little bit lost there. All right, so here's, here's the deal. <clears throat> Abraham's under a tree, and he's waiting for his next step. Verse 17, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot, imagine this, this is what God does. You, see, you read this before, and it's like, okay, I don't understand what that means, and I'm just going to move right on to the next story, right? But look at this. When the sun had set, And darkness had fallen. A smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces of the animal. Verse 18. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Now look up here for just a second. Does it say that Abram did anything? And does it say that on that day, the Lord and Abram made a covenant with each other. You know what Abram did while all this was going on? He just sits over on the side underneath his tree and watches the whole thing happen. It's God and God alone, and God chose to symbolically represent himself with a fire pot and a torch that then walks through the animals. He doesn't ask Abram to do anything. God was basically saying, I'm binding myself to this for you. You don't have to do anything. And folks, that is the gospel. Jesus is going to die, blood covenant. He's going to do something on your behalf, and you don't have to do anything in order for it to become a reality. I'm God saying, this is amazing. Just through belief, just through faith alone. I am binding myself to you. The certainty that you're going to be in eternity with me forever. You don't have to do anything. And in his culture, this was unbelievable because it was always two people who went through this, okay? And and there were always terms and vows and and then the ratification come. And, And all that's happened is God's given his terms back in Genesis 12, 2, and 3, And he says, I'm going to do this. And then he says, know for certain, Abraham, and here's how you're going to know for certain. I want you to enact the blood covenant. I'm going to speak in terms that you're familiar with that was common in your day, and I'm going to walk through this without you joining me. You don't have to do anything. I mean, Abraham just watched the whole thing happen, and God basically is saying, Abram, I don't care what you do, do, D-O, I don't care what you do. I don't care how bad you foul this up with your life. I am going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bring it back to this piece of real estate, and there's going to be a huge nation here, and your family lineage is going to bless all of the families in all the world because I'm going to bring a person through your family lineage. That's what he said. 
And I'm going to do it. I'm the one who's involved. You're not involved in this at all, Abram. But, but what do I need to do, Abram? You don't need to do anything. I'm walking through this without you. Now, let me ask you a question before we go on. Why would God do such a crazy thing? <laughs> I mean, when he had Adam and mankind set up just where he wanted it, he's relating with them. He's creating. He didn't even have to create. He's creating, and he wants love to be true love, and he wants there to be two willing people who freely choose to enter into that relationship or stay in that relationship. So he allows the one tree and they go and they foul the whole thing up. And with that decision meant all kinds of evil and difficulty and sorrow and pain. Adam and Eve couldn't have possibly realized the magnitude of pain and difficulty and challenge and struggle that the humankind, humanity is gonna experience from that point on. And God could have been so mad like, oh my goodness, I made the whole thing. I mean, they wouldn't even know that they don't exist if I hadn't made them. They live in this perfect utopia. I had everything set up just the way that I wanted it. This is amazing. And then they walk away. And now my creation, who I love so much, is now gonna experience crime. I mean, the very second sin is murder, right? With Cain and Abel. The second sin, we go straight from like eating an apple that we're not supposed to eat to, to murder. And in the times of Noah, we know that People just did evil like they wanted to. Noah happens in between Adam and, and, and Abraham. It just all kinds of evil. And now they're going to experience all this pain. I mean, God could have just said, forget them and like put his thumb down on all of creation and said, we're just going to start over. Let's just destroy them. But that's not what he does. Because he's the God of love. Because he's the same God as we know him to be in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. It's the same being. He begins to pursue. He doesn't give up. He's just relentless. He says, I'm gonna make this promise to you, Abraham, and you can count me in. I am going to keep my foot on the path. I'm gonna keep moving forward. I am going after this promise, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. I will win mankind back to me. Isn't that amazing? Now, why would God do that? Because of love. Because God is on a relentless mission to reconnect with his prized creation. The creature, the, the creator and the creature have been disconnected last week as we saw. Christmas is all about a God who said, I want to reconnect. I want to fill that piece of your soul that is now missing because we've been unplugged. And now we're going to not just be in relationship, but we're going to relate with one another. You can trust me. He's pursuing Abraham. He's going after him. He says, I'm going to obligate myself to you, and you are not obligated to me. Now let's relate with each other. I will do that, he says, because that's how important you are to me, Abram, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and all throughout humanity, and David, and Jeremiah, and now you, Sheila, and Steve. I will do that. Because that's how important you are to me. And then do you know what happened? Abram had a son, <clears throat> and, and that son had a couple of sons. You remember? Esau and Jacob. Isaac had Esau and Jacob. And, and then one of those sons had about 12 or 13 sons, right, Jacob? And then do you know what happened? That whole family went to Egypt just like God told them that, that Abram, the, the, the family would go. And they developed into a nation right under the Egyptians' noses. And Moses was born about 400 years into this, and Moses takes a whole nation 400 years later and marches him right back to the very piece of real estate, to the very land that God promised he would give all of his descendants. It's unbelievable. And about 600 years later, they enter into this, this land after this promise, and they start developing a, a nation there in the, in the new land, and there are kings, and there's battles, and there's armies, and, and every single generation, the leadership of Israel just messes it up. I mean, David and, and Solomon, and it gets worse from there, way worse from there. Just Israel's just, just we're just going to leave God, and we're going to start worshiping all these idols and did these grotesque practices in order to worship these idols, which were really satanic. Of course, they were grotesque, stuff that God never wanted for them to do. And he says, you know what? God's, God's up there in heaven watching all this. He's like, I'm really glad I did not make it conditional upon their behavior. I'm really glad it was just me kind of going through those animals with my pot, just making it all about me because you know what? 
we can still sound, and he keeps his nose to the grind, his foot on the path, and he keeps marching toward this relentless pursuit of mankind. And, 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 and he, he, it's just unbelievable. I will not be deterred in a sense that he's saying, I am going to bless every family on the earth. You can't possibly mess this up because, because, listen to this, I am your hope. I, your hope's not in some ethereal out there, you know, out there thing. Who's going to make that future a reality? Our hope is in a who, a who, a person. You can have hope this Christmas because you know the person of God. You're in relationship with the person of God, and he doesn't just want it to be like, okay, now there's a line that's connecting the two of us. I want you to come to me. Because you know who I am, you know what I did for you, and you know that I kept my foot all the way from the time of Abraham on the path towards moving in humanity's direction. Because I want connection, I want intimacy, I want relating and trust, and I will not be deprived of what I want. When you read the story of Israel, I mean, talk about just a mess, just one inconsistency after another. And 2,000 years, <clears throat> now we can't even think that way, right? 2,000 years, we just kind of throw that out there. I mean, think of how long your life is, right? You're, you're 25 years old, you're 40 years old, and you think about a month as being a long period of time. 2,000 years, 2,000 years after God made this unconditional covenant with Abram, who had no children at 100 years old, by the way, 2,000 years later in a city of, of Nazareth, right there in the middle of the land that God promised, Nazareth. An angel appears to a young teenage girl and says, I've got some good news. You're pregnant. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's not good news just yet because you could get stoned for that. But like, we're going to, we're going to, it's all going to work out. And, and I've got, and, and he's going to be called the son of God. And eventually everybody's going to realize him to be the Messiah and you're not going to get stoned, Mary, for being pregnant out of wedlock. Like this is actually good news. And, and he's going to be the savior of the world. And then he went over, yeah. He went over and woke up Joseph, who was, they weren't in the same house because they were doing things right before they got married. And he's over there with Joseph and he, he visits Joseph and he says, I got some good news. Mary's pregnant. Oh wait, that's not good news yet to you either because she has not, but she has not been sleeping around, okay, on, on, behind your back and, and she's pregnant. I know that you guys haven't like slept together and everything and, and you, I know you know that, but like, she, the, the son that you're going to have is going to be the fulfillment of prophecy that I gave 700 years before to Isaiah that says virgin will be with child. And he's going to be the fulfillment of the promise that I gave to Abraham 2,000 years ago where I said all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed through you. Joseph, you get to father the son of God who's the savior of the world. Christmas is not a one-time isolated episode of manger and child. Christmas is about the fulfillment of millennia, of, of prophecy after foretelling, after foretelling of a future Messiah who was to come. And think about this. You're, you're maybe not a believer, and it's like, I don't really know if the Bible's true and all this. How do you keep something alive for 2,000 years? Where people die and the person who first said it, you know, kind of like telephone, kind of handed it through to the next generation. And we got to keep the thing alive because, you know, Abraham said that God told him that there was going to be a person who would come and bless all the families of the earth. And then, then we got Jeremiah who gives another prophecy, which is about 600, well, more like 800 years before uh, the Messiah. Then Micah says that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. What's a Bethlehem? Nobody heard of a Bethlehem. It's this little small microscopic little town, dusty town outside of Jerusalem. But he's going to be born in Bethlehem. See, Bethlehem wasn't famous at the time. Bethlehem was a nothing. And, and on down the line, we have so many prophecies of this future Messiah. And it got so specific, especially in Isaiah and Jeremiah. How, do, how does that happen? See, that right there in and of itself is a proof that God is real and that the God of the Bible is the same author throughout all of time and has had his foot on the path moving down the road of this 
He knew that there would be people in the 21st century who would be skeptical. Ah, I don't really know if it, it could happen. Hey, 2,000 years of prophecy? It's unbelievable. And then what do we find Jesus doing? Jesus is saying, here's what God is like, right? In the New Testament. He's saying, God is like a shepherd who lost his sheep and has 99, but has, he lost his sheep and he goes after them. He's relentless. Oh, God is like a, a, a lady who's lost her precious, valuable coin and dusts out the whole house and even moves all the furniture outside the house in order to regain her precious, precious coin. Oh, God is like a father who, who lost his son and the son just said, I don't care about you, dad. I'm gonna leave you for dead and I'm gonna take all of your inheritance and I'm just gonna go live like hell like I want to be in control of my life because I'm my own authority. And a father who waits on a footstep waiting for his lost son to come home. God's relentless. And you see the God, Jesus, is sitting here going, I can describe for you what this fa- my father is like because I know him personally. We're in a triunity, a, a trinity. And it's the same God that Abraham knew 2,000 years before. See, we think Emmanuel, God after us, God can't really be like for us or with us. God's after us because I'm not doing right and he's always mad at me because I didn't get this or that right. See, that's kind of maybe where you are this Christmas. And that's what's going on in your heart. And you you think about your year that you've had where you've just been so mad at God for what's happened in the earth and what's happened to your life and you're just just resentful and you're kind of coming hobbling, spiritually speaking, into your relationship with God this Christmas. And you think, Emmanuel, right? God with us. No, God after us, or God's mad at us. Emmanuel, God is out to get us, or God wants to squash us. That's religion. That's religious kind of thinking. It's about what I do in order to get into God's good graces, and I have to continue to do it in order to stay in God's good graces. That's religion. Jesus says, no, Emmanuel, God with us. It's not against us. It's unbelievable. So let me ask you a question. We're going to close. What did Abraham have to do to receive this covenant? Nothing. It was unconditional. You, you, you've heard Christians and even pastors kind of give lip service to unconditional. This, this is what? It has just kind of been words to you. This is what they're getting at. This is an unconditional love. And it's, and it's that that undoes us, guys. You say, well, I, this is the problem with Christianity. Christians don't have any incentive to stay close to him and stay connected to him because they don't have to keep earning their salvation. No. When you really understand it, when you really realize it, it's like, I am just so overwhelmed with the unbelievable love of God. He could have done whatever he wanted to to humanity. He could have done whatever he wanted to to me. But he chose to pursue me. And why am I even sitting here hearing this message? Why am I... Ah, this is, he's pursuing me and he makes his love for me unconditional in the same way he did for Abram. And look at what Abraham, look what it says about Abraham having salvation. This is Genesis 15, six. Look at this. Then Abram believed the Lord. This is in scripture. Look it up. This is, this is amazing. Whatever translation you have, it's, it's the same thing. Believed the Lord and the Lord credited it to him. It means gave it to him or credited it, sort of like, you know, gave it to him as righteousness. What's righteousness? To bring into alignment, to be made right with God. The holiness of God, don't miss this, is now your holiness. Not because of anything that you do, but because you've been forgiven of everything. You've been given the righteousness of God, Abraham. I'm gonna give that to you 2,000 years before the Messiah came, what did, what did Abraham believe? He believed what had been told to him. That I'm going to make your name great, the land, all the kids, but then every nation on the earth is going to be blessed through you. And Abraham looked up at the stars and he goes, okay, feels like I'm stepping off of a cliff with no bridge. But I believe you. This Christmas... Maybe for you, that's where you are. 
and you don't even know if you're a believer, that you've truly placed your faith in Christ, that you've truly believed. That's what it is. Before the Messiah came, pre-Messiah um, arrival people who lived in the pre-Messiah arrival times, right? They just believed what had been told to them and got credited to them as righteousness. Now, people who live in the post-Messiah time, they believe what was done by this past Messiah who came in history time in Israel back 2,000 years ago, and they simply believe, and it will be credited to them as righteousness. If you're here today and you know that you've never placed your faith in Christ, or you're kind of worried that maybe you haven't, this day is for you. And I ask you not to pass it by. If you're there through your computer screen or through your TV, and maybe you're there as a family, and you know you've never placed your faith in Christ, what better time than at Christmas time? In a moment where you've so understood so clearly the gospel to pray to receive Jesus Christ as your savior. Let's do this. Don't let your time pass you by. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just wanna give you the opportunity to pray. We're not gonna have you come up here and, and do anything embarrassing. This is just simply you with the Lord making a decision for the rest of your life. I'm receiving Jesus Christ who was given at Christmas time as my Lord and savior. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've been the same God from Genesis to Revelation that you've been on a relentless pursuit of mankind. And truth be told, if I think about my life, you've nudged me, you've been on a pursuit of me. I see different ways that you moved and I've wondered, is that God or is that just my hyperactive conscience? But that's you. And what are the odds that I would be sitting right here with all that I'm dealing with and all that I'm thinking about that you would make the gospel so clear through an Old Testament passage? It's unbelievable, your pursuit of me. Thank you for your overwhelming love. And God, I pray right now, acknowledging my sin and repenting of my sin, I place my faith in Jesus Christ, death on the cross for the payment of my sins so that I can be forgiven. Just say that back to him. Thank you that this is a white Christmas for me. And whether I was a believer or not before this moment, what matters now is that I'm a believer in you. And this is a white Christmas where I'm walking down the aisle, figuratively speaking, and I'm saying, you are who I am taking my oath, my vow to be in relationship with, marriage with, spiritually speaking. Thank you for receiving me Thank you for wanting to be one with me. What an unbelievable truth that the Holy Spirit is now going to indwell me and be in me. What an unbelievable picture. God, would you place the right people in my life, a community, a church of Jesus followers, not nominal Christians, not non-Christians, in my life so that I can begin walking, having help and understanding what it means to relate to you. I get the concept of relationship, but what does it mean to talk with you and relate with you? Would you place those people in my life? Help me have the faith to move into a church and really be a part of a church, this church, Vining's Church, so that I can really know what it means to walk with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name.